Not all people are people people, if that makes any sense. Some people are introverted to the max. They love nothing more than getting as much alone time as possible. They even go as far as to build special homes to facilitate their need to get away from anyone and everyone. These homes, they'd be perfect for them. But would they be perfect for you? Well, watch and let us know. These are the 20 most isolated homes in the world. Number 20, Casa Brutale. Dream homes and homes of your dreams, they're not the same thing. This one definitely belongs in the latter category. This amazing visionary structure is actually built into a cliffside. It's primarily made out of concrete, glass, and wood. You can reach the entrance by descending 50 stairs towards the Aegean Sea, or you can simply take an elevator. It really is like a weird dream. The entrance features a unique, tall, rotating wooden door, and the glass facade offers stunning sea views. It's minimalism at its finest. The remaining space is open, clean, and uncluttered. The dining area sports a cast concrete table and chairs that are topped with warm wood. A smoothly contoured fireplace is on a wall beside a bench. Behind the dining table is a guest room tucked under an ancient slab with a glass corner. Service rooms like a storage, bathroom, and water closet are accessible through a small hallway near the guest room. Once, the home seemed destined to be paper architecture, with extravagant features like a glass bottom pool hanging over a cliff. But surprisingly, the project's now found a buyer and is set to be constructed. It's a project that everyone has a strong opinion about, one way or another. If you want to have a little me time, but you still want to check out all the more fascinating stuff happening in the world, give us a subscribe for more videos. And hit that like button to let the algorithm know you want a little peace and quiet. Now it's time for the strange topic. See these houses? Both of them were designed by an architect, and this guy kind of has a creative vibe. See, his whole deal is pioneering specialist homes designed for longevity and self-sustainability. So what does that mean exactly? In short, his homes are perfect for people that want to live in total isolation, as far away from the rest of the world as possible. He's become the architect of choice for many billionaires, designing custom homes that create a scenario where billionaires can hide away from the rest of the world in total peace. Sounds like it'd be pretty zen if that's your cup of tea. Would you want to live in a place like this? Or would you prefer the hustle and bustle of city central living? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag strange topic. Number 19, Village of Gossadeller, Vagar Faroe Islands. Gossadeller is a small village located on the western side of Vagar in the Faroe Islands. This place offers some awesome views of the nearby island of Michinas. Right on the edge of Michinas Fjord, and the village is surrounded by some of Vagar's tallest mountains. To the north is Arnia Fall, standing at 2,369 feet, and in the east is Estyr Dinter, with a height of 2,346 feet. Estyr Dinter translates to peak in the east in English. The southern views are equally breathtaking. Because the village sits higher than the water level, it doesn't have a great spot for boat landings. Historically, residents who wanted to fish had to keep their boats near the village of Boar. A stairway was constructed from the beach to the village in 1940 during the British rule over the Faroe Islands. Previously, reaching any other town by road required traversing mountains higher than 1,300 feet, making it a challenging journey. Due to its remoteness, the village's population dwindled over the years. Only 16 people lived in Gossadella in 2002, and many homes remained vacant. The population slightly increased to 18 in 2012, but dropped to 11 by 2020. Things looked up a bit when the Gossadeller Stunlin Tunnel was carved through the mountain in 2004, allowing car access to the village. Locals hoped this would boost the population, and it did briefly, peaking at 23 in 2010. However, as of 2020, the population has again decreased to just 11 residents. Number 18, the Crystal Mill. The Crystal Mill also known as the Old Mill, sits perched on a bluff overlooking the Crystal River in Crystal, Colorado, USA. Constructed in 1892, you can reach it via a four-wheel drive from Marble, Colorado. It was originally designed with a horizontal wheel, and the mill used a water engine to run an air compressor. 
This compressed air was then used to operate other machinery and tools. George C. Eaton and B.S. Phillips, who were fundraising for the Sheep Mountain Tunnel and Mining Company, were the builders of this unusual space. Its main function was to power the Sheep Mountain Tunnel and assist nearby silver mines by generating compressed air. The mill ceased operations when the Sheep Mountain Tunnel mine shut down in 1917. In 1985, the mill earned a spot on the National Register of Historic Places. These days, it's known by two names, the Crystal Mill and the Old Crystal Mill. If you look back to when it was operational, it went by either the Lost Horse Mill or the Sheep Mountain Powerhouse. Lost Horse refers to the mine claim where the mill is situated. The term mill is used because there was a three-stamp mill housed in a building adjacent to the structure, which still stands to the south. Number 17, Casa do Penedo. This house in Portugal might remind you of the Flintstones, but it was actually built in 1974. Despite its location near a wind farm, the house, known as Casa do Penedo, doesn't have electricity. Instead, it relies on candles for illumination. It was constructed from four large boulders, and the house used to be a vacation retreat. Work on the house began in 1972 and wrapped up two years later in 1974. A local engineer from Guimarães was behind the construction. Over time, the house transitioned from a holiday spot to a small museum, displaying artifacts and photos that capture its history and the stunning landscape around it. The unique look and harmony with nature have made Casa do Panedo increasingly popular among tourists. Due to its rising interest, the original owners decided to relocate. While it doesn't have any electrical amenities, even in spite of being so close to the large wind turbines, the house is still quite livable. It's a compact two-story dwelling but it's got a comfy vibe. The first floor houses a kitchen and a modest living room. Furnished in a rustic style, the living room features a heavy sofa made of eucalyptus wood and concrete that weighs nearly 800 pounds. A wooden staircase leads to the sleeping area on the upper floor, but we can't verify if the garbage disposal unit is an actual live dinosaur chilling hungrily under the countertop or something more modern. Number 16, Park Hyatt Maldives Hadaha Huvadu Atoll, Maldives. The Park Hyatt Maldives Hadaha is a chic boutique hotel situated in the Gafu Atoll, one of the Maldives' most expansive atolls. The area remains largely pristine, and it features one of Maldives' most stunning coral reefs. The nearest inhabited island is a good seven miles away. So, one of the most incredible things about this spot is the combination of being right near the equator and a long way from light pollution. This means the views of the night sky are breathtaking. To reach the island, it's an hour-long flight from the Malé International Airport, followed by a 30-minute boat ride. The resort itself has a modest count of 50 villas. 14 of these are ingeniously built on stilts directly over the lagoon. A lot of natural materials have been incorporated always with a focus on comfort. As for underwater adventures, the Gafu Halifu Atoll, given its protected status, promises exceptional diving experiences. Its healthy coral ecosystems are teeming with diverse fish species. And let's not forget, Hadaha has been honored with the title of Best Diving Hotel in the Maldives. Number 15, La Rinconada, Peru. This town is in the Peruvian Andes, and it's right near a gold mine, but that's about the only thing it's near. Amazingly, it holds the title for the world's highest permanent settlement, located up at 16,700 feet above sea level. National Geographic reports that its population swelled from a tiny gold prospecting camp to 30,000 inhabitants between 2001 and 2009. This boom was primarily driven by a 235% increase in gold prices. Oddly enough, the town's elevation makes its climate more akin to the west coast of Greenland than a location just 14 degrees from the equator. The gold mine is owned by the Corporación Andania. They employ most of the men in the town under a unique system called cachorreos. In this setup, miners work for 30 straight days without pay, and then they get a single day to mine for their benefit. On that day, they can haul away as much ore as they can shoulder, though it's uncertain whether the ore contains gold. It's something of a lottery that I suspect works out strongly in favor of the corporation and not so great for the miners. Miners are free to take home any promising nuggets or rich ore chunks they find, however. 
Women aren't allowed to work directly in the mines and are called palakiras. They earn their living by sorting through waste material to find items of value. Infrastructure in the town is lacking. There's no plumbing or sewer system. And the health situation is not great, as the low air pressure at this altitude leads to hypoxia, affecting at least 25% of the population. And then there's also the mercury poisoning from the mine. Altogether, this is a very tough life. Number 14. Katsky Pillar, Imereti, Georgia This is 45 meters high pillar. The Katsky Pillar is a limestone monolith. You can find it in the village of Katsky, near the town of Chiatra in Georgia's West Imereti region. Is anyone else starting to feel like they're in a Zelda game watching this video, or is it just me? Anyway, standing about 40 meters high, the pillar offers view of the Katskara Valley and the small river that flows into the Quivirala. Locals revere this rock. It features visible church ruins over a large area, and they regard it as the pillar of life and a representation of the true cross. And a whole ton of legends have sprung up around it. Researchers didn't actually climb or survey the pillar until 1944. The digs turned up some info which tells us the ruins belong to a hermitage from the early Middle Ages. Archaeologists decided it dates back to the 9th or 10th century. By 2009, the monastery atop the pillar was renovated as a part of the state-funded initiative. Monk Maxim Quadzaradze, a Chiotara native, was instrumental in reviving the religious activities when he arrived in 1995. From 2005 to 2009, the monastery was restored, with assistance from the National Agency for Cultural Heritage Preservation of Georgia. The pillar used to be accessible to the public, with a safety rule that only men could climb the iron ladder leading to the top. But I'm sure no woman has ever minded this. Maxim, an Orthodox church monk, has lived atop the Katsky pillar for over two decades and descends just twice a week. Number 13. House on the Vest Manajar Archipelago Lots of buzz and wild theories are swirling around photos of this solitary white house perched on a remote island. It's been dubbed the world's loneliest house and the ultimate retreat for introverts. Pictures of this white house blew up on Instagram. The images feature a quaint log cabin situated atop a lush hill, flanked by blue seas on either side. This house is on Ellie Day Island, which is situated far to the south of Iceland. It's part of Vest Manager, a cluster of 15 to 18 islands. Though the island is uninhabited now, it used to be home to five families. The last family moved out in the 1930s, and it's been empty ever since. Speculation about this isolated house has been rife for ages. Rumors range from a mysterious billionaire building it as a zombie apocalypse hideout to ownership claims by Icelandic singer Björk or a reclusive religious hermit. Some skeptics on social media have even claimed that the house is just a Photoshop fabrication. In reality, the house is indeed located on Ellie Day Island and is owned by the Ellie Day Hunting Association. Built in the 1950s, it's now a hunting cabin and sauna for members of the group, who use it primarily for puffin hunting. Number 12. Meteora, Thessaly, Greece The Holy Trinity Monastery, an Eastern Orthodox establishment, is in the Peneus Valley, not far from the town of Kalambaka in central Greece. This isolated place is set right on top of a cliff, way up in the sky. The monastery is one of the 24 originally built at Meteoria, a name that translates to suspended in the air in Greek. Out of those 24, only six are still functional and open to visitors. One of the churches here is on the UNESCO World Heritage List and was constructed between the 14th and 15th centuries. During those same centuries, monasteries were established on perilous cliffs around Meteora. Religious communities had already set up hermitages on these cliffs as far back as the 11th century. In the 1400s, John Uros, a figurehead emperor of the Serbs and Greeks, became a monk and relocated to Meteora, where he funded, renovated, and established monasteries. Given the political turbulence of the era, monks sought refuge in these cliffside monasteries. Holy Trinity once housed 50 monks, but that number dwindled to just five by the early 1900s. Number 11, Paro Valley, Bhutan. 
The Taksang Palfeng Monastery, also known as Paro Taksang or the Tiger's Nest Monastery, is a small Buddhist temple complex located about six miles north of the town of Paro. It's perched off a cliff that's high on the upper Paro Valley of Bhutan. The complex consists of four main temples and residential quarters. Each building has a balcony overlooking the scenic Paro Valley. To move between these structures, you'll find rock steps, stairways, and several wooden bridges. According to legend, Guru Padma Sambhava, also known as Guru Rinpoche, flew to this site from Kempajoyang, Tibet, on the back of his tigress in the 8th century. Pretty cool! He was a royal Brahmin who introduced Tantric Buddhism to Bhutan and Tibet. Fast forward to 1692, Gyalse Tenzin Ragbie, the then leader of Bhutan, constructed the Paro Taksing Monastery. It's believed he was the reincarnation of Padi Sambhava. He laid the first stone of the monastery during a visit to the sacred caves. An old tale even suggests that the temple clings to the cliff with the help of the hairs of Kondroma, who are female celestial beings. On April 19th of 1988, a tragic fire broke out at Paro Taksang, destroying invaluable paintings, artifacts, and statues. A monk also lost his life in the blaze, and the complex was mostly ruined. Due to the monastery's remote location, emergency assistance was hard to come by at the time. However, Jigme Singye Wangchuk, the fourth king of Bhutan, took on the task of carefully restoring the monastery to its former glory. Number 10. Warzazet, Morocco Years ago, Warzazet was a modest stopping point for African traders heading to France or northern Morocco. Sheikh Abu al-Abbas Ahmed bin Abella al wakitsi al-Wazazi, the long-name emir of the Qusaba of Wazazet, aided the Saudis in seizing the Sodra region in the 1600s. Under French rule, the town expanded significantly, working as a garrison town, administrative hub, and customs post. The Kaspa Tauret is a notable landmark in the area. Back in the day, it was owned by the local Kai, but later came into the possession of Tami El Glaoui. A Krupp field gun that seriously bolstered Glaoui's power is displayed outside the Kasbah today. Warzazet sits at an elevation of approximately 3,800 feet above sea level, right in the middle of a barren plateau to the south of the high Atlas Mountains. Further south lies the desert. Warzazet is often referred to as the door of the desert, and the homes are set amidst the mountains of the Sahara. They're constructed from materials like adobe, rammed earth, clay brick, and wood, much like the buildings in nearby UNESCO World Heritage Site village of Ait Ben Hado. Number 9. Church of St. Johann The Church of St. John of Nepomuk in Renui draws people in with its tranquil setting. Built in 1744, thanks to funding from mine owner Michael von Jenner, this Baroque structure is a peaceful haven. The altarpiece by Franz Unterberger depicts Mary on the throne holding baby Jesus, while John of Nepomuk gestures to indicate he'll keep her secrets. But maybe he didn't hold up his end of the bargain, as John met his sorry end in the Volta River. The unusual thing is that it was a star-shaped garland that led to the discovery of his body. The church's onion-shaped copper dome includes a star, which is naturally a reference to this story. Canonized in 1729, John now serves as the protector of Bohemia, as well as confessors and people at the risk of drowning. He's also the go-to saint for defending reputations. Inside the church, you'll find nine Baroque paintings that narrate John's life. Painted likely around the mid-18th century, the works are attributed to Nicholas Wies, a, a court painter from Bressanoe. The church's entrance features an ornate front wall with a fresco of its patron saint. An inscription reads, erected by Michael Jenner in 1744 on the church's facade. Given that Michael Jenner passed away in 1723, it's assumed that his dedicated descendants added the description. His niece, Maria Barbara, who had married George von Merrill from Bolzano in 1720 and inherited Ranui, was still alive at this time, as was her cousin Joseph Anton Jenner, a frequent visitor to Ranui. In fact, it was Joseph Anton Jenner who built the small church. Number 8. Three Fingers Lookout Cabin The most isolated cabin in Washington is perched on the south peak of Three Fingers Mountain. 
in the Mount Banker Suquamish National Forest. Sitting just shy of 7,000 feet above sea level, this 14 by 14 foot cabin was erected in the early 1930s. It's one of Washington's vintage lookout buildings and was actively used for spotting forest fires from 1933 to 1942. Now, you might wonder how they managed to get building materials up there in the 1930s. It was no mean feat, and that much is for certain. The project started with dynamite and took around three years to complete. They blasted 15 feet off the top of the peak to create a level surface for construction. Wherever possible, materials were moved using animal packs. For the final 600 feet, a unique system of ropes and ladders was used. The cabin's floor is bolted to the solid rock below to prevent it from blowing off the cliff. Cables anchored to rock formations help secure the structure against strong winds. When the windows are open, the views are truly expansive. A new roof was added in 2015, transported by helicopter, a luxury that they did not have back in the 1930s. The U.S. Forest Service labels the journey to the cabin as difficult and strenuous. The last half mile is recommended only for seasoned climbers. It involves descending a steep section and climbing a set of vertical ladders, all while using a rather suspect looking rope for support. Number 7. Arnarstapi, Iceland Arnarstapi is a quaint fishing village located on the southern Snaffelanes Peninsula, right at the foot of Mount Stapafell. While it used to be a bustling trade center with more residents, these days Arnarstapi comes alive mainly in the summer. That's when the fishing boats and leisure vessels crowd the docks. One hiking trail that comes highly recommended skirts past Ned Stavitten Lake. This route, formerly a horse path, runs between Arnastapi and the neighboring village of Helnar. It meanders through lava fields and along the coastline. It's a scenic easy walk that takes roughly an hour. You gotta go to get uh, the ocean view. In 1979, the cliffs at Arnastapi were designated a natural reserve. You'll find a large colony of arctic terns near the village, and a walk along the beach provides a chance to see the birds, as well as striking lava formations. Additional natural landmarks near Arnastapi include Long Drangar, two towering basalt columns perched on a cliff. These are remnants of an ancient volcanic crater, largely eroded by ocean waves. Also, the beautiful Rudfeld Gaja Gorge can be found on Botsnafjall Mountain. It's accessible for exploration during the summer months. Number 6. Xiang Gongxi, China The Hanging Monastery, also known as Xiang Gongxi, or Temple Suspended in the Air, is located in Hunyon County, Shangxi Province. It's an incredible example of architectural ingenuity, positioned about a third of the way up a cliff in what's known as the Golden Dragon Gorge. The construction of the monastery goes way back to the Northern Wei period in the 6th century, but some parts have been restored or rebuilt during the Tang and Qing dynasties, as well as more recently than that. The monastery complex comprises 40 caves or rooms and 6 primary halls. Its marquee feature is the elaborate wooden facade. But check out this huge network of pavilions and walkways that are seemingly perched on beams jettisoning out from the cliff in various directions. Topping these structures are beautiful color tiles. The cave holds some real treasures, including amazing bronze statues of figures from Buddhism. Even though the monastery was originally built on a sacred Taoist mountain, it's evolved over time. Inside, you'll find statues of Buddha, Confucius, and Lao Tzu, sitting together as if they're just the best of buds. Number 5. Tristan de Cunha Tristan de Cunha is a very remote bunch of volcanic islands that belong to the UK. They're far, far away from London though, being in the South Atlantic Ocean. In fact, they hold the title of the world's most remote inhabited archipelago. It's roughly 1,700 miles away from Cape Town, South Africa. Tristan itself is an active volcano, and the islands are home to some unique wildlife. The main settlement, known as Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, has over 235 British residents and it's considered the most isolated, inhabited place in the world. The islands were first spotted by Tristan de Cunha, a Portuguese explorer in 1506. He couldn't make landfall because of rough seas. The current inhabitants are believed to be descended from 15 original ancestors, 8 men and 7 women. 
who arrived on the island between 1816 and 1908. These founding men hailed from places like Scotland, England, the Netherlands, the US, and Italy. Today, the inhabitants all have one of the eight original surnames. In 1961, Queen Mary's Peak erupted, forcing the entire population to evacuate and relocate to England via Cape Town. The following year, a Royal Society expedition went to assess the damage and found that Edinburgh of the Seven Seas was mostly unscathed. By 1963, most families returned to the islands. Number 4. Lukamir From the Rakinitka River, a trail winds its ways up along cliff edges, leading to Lukamir after about three hours of hiking. The trail eventually opens to a clearing where a village is laid out. Here, a cluster of short, old stone houses with wooden roofs sits on the canyon's edge, overlooking the river more than 2,600 feet below, shimmering like a silver ribbon in the afternoon sun. Local shepherds donning berets, wool pants, and tweed coats gather outdoors with their wives, who are dressed in bright dresses and traditional veils. Electricity did not reach this village until the 1960s. The community lacks a store, market, school, doctor, or any kind of shop. From late autumn to mid-spring, the village is inaccessible by car and remains uninhabited. Visitors who arrive are usually welcomed by a shepherd sitting on a rock, casually whittling a stick and maybe cracking jokes. Tourists notwithstanding, the residents have maintained their love of this sacred and special spot. The older generation makes it a point to keep traditions alive and pass them down to younger family members. Number 3. McMurdo Station McMurdo Station is an American research hub located in Antarctica, specifically at the southern end of Ross Island. This falls within the area claimed by New Zealand as a Ross dependency, and it sits along the coast of McMurdo Sound. It's operated by the U.S. Antarctic Program, a division of the National Science Foundation. The station can host up to 1,500 people. This makes it the largest community in Antarctica, and one of three year-round U.S. science facilities on the continent. Anything headed to or from the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station passes through McMurdo first. The folks who live there, often calling it Mactown, maintain it as the hub for U.S. operations in Antarctica. McMurdo is also connected by road to New Zealand's smaller Scott Base. Back in the day, McMurdo was the site of Antarctica's sole TV station, AFAN-TV. The first broadcasts were launched on November 19th of 1973. They featured U.S. shows, interviews, and daily news and weather updates. These days, McMurdo receives three channels from the American Forces Network. Number 2. Oyster House This house feels like a dream spot for any summer stay, even if it's currently empty. This is one remote spot that will be bringing people in for a long time to take photos and even just paint the scene. It's one of Brittany's most iconic scenes. The quay side offers a magical vantage point for watching sunsets. There's a tale that St. Cado wanted to build a bridge to link the island with the mainland across the Ria de Tel, but lacked both the funds and expertise. Then, Satan showed up and offered to build the bridge in exchange for the soul of the first creature to cross it. Yeah, that's right, Satan himself just casually rocked up and started pulling weird stunts. Anyway, St. Cato agreed and overnight the bridge was constructed. Come morning, St. Cato cleverly sent a cat across the bridge, foiling Satan's dastardly expectations. Not very saint-like to send a cat's soul to hell, but okay. In the heart of the village square stands a Romanesque chapel dedicated to St. Cado, constructed by monks in the 12th century. The calvary in the village is filled with sculptures, and a fountain is often submerged by the incoming tide. Number 1. Wee White House When you think of Glencoe, Scotland, chances are you picture that solitary White House set against the backdrop of a mountain peak. A lot of folks drive past this house in Glencoe, yet few know its name or its purpose. It's called the Lagengarb Hut, and it was originally built as a home for crofters, people in small farming communities who live off the land and rent a house together. In these communities, residents raise their own livestock and grow crops, sharing any earnings amongst themselves. It's a way of life that is still alive in the Scottish Highlands. 
The National Trust took over the Lanningarb hut along with the rest of Glencoe in 1935. After its construction in 1946, the Scottish Mountaineering Club has been in charge of its upkeep. Over the years, the hut has seen various renovations and has transitioned from a crofter's dwelling to a remote bunkhouse for hikers exploring the area. So, which one of these places would be your dream home? Do you like to be away from it all, or do you prefer the rat race of city life? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff, showing up on screen right now. See you next time.